with them, I'm going to let you introduce yourselves. Irene, will you uh, tell us your name and if you want to tell us your age. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm proud of it. Uh, well, my name is Irene Jernigan McCall. Um, I'm 94 years old. I will be 95 the first day of February in 2016. Uh, I had, I grew up in a family of 11 children, uh, six boys, four girls. Of course, I was number 11. Elizabeth. All of my um, siblings are dead. I'm the only survivor. Thank you, Irene. Uh, Elizabeth, please. I'm Elizabeth McMillan. I was born Elizabeth Bond, and uh, in a month and a half, I'll be 91 years old, and uh, I had a brother and a sister. My brother's deceased, but my sister lives in Tallahassee. And I was raised by my grandparents. Irene's mother and dad was my grandmother and grandfather. My dad died before I was born. My mother died when I was four, so my grandparents raised me. Well, you and Irene is your aunt. Yes. But you are really siblings. <laughs> yes. You grew up together as, as in the same household. And, and I was born in her mother's house, and I grew there. I lived there until I got married. And that was in? Um, <laughs> 19... <laughs> Let me see. 40. You're asking why well, I got married in 1941 in 40. November. Okay. And de and the Japs bombed Pearl Harbor December the second. I was just married, not quite a month. Well, uh, going back to the uh, Jernigan siblings, in the Welburn book, they had said that uh, W. C. and Sally moved to Swanee County from Columbia County. Right. Uh, with two children. Yes, Effie and Ethel. Effie. Ethel, her mother. Yeah, and, and that was your mother. That's My mother was the know. oldest child. Oh, okay. I, I didn't know that. So and she and was they, Mama and Papa, uh, moved to Welburn in 1898, and they bought their home there from a Dr. Bothwell. And that's where you two grew up? I, I was born there. And you were born there. And, and Papa, you know, as I said, he was a farmer. But our farm was about three miles east of Welburn, toward Lake City. Okay, is that the uh, Bell's, uh, there's a community that I believe your parents were in 1900, were in Bell's Corner or something like that in Columbia County. Yeah. Is that, is that uh, really just a community that where your farm was? Do you remember? Well, it, it it could be, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because the farm was in both yeah. Columbia and Well, the County. farm was partially in Sewanee County and partially in Columbia County. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that farm now is owned by the McKeithens. Okay. So they, Mama, well, not Mama and Papa, but um, Merle. me and my siblings sold the farm to Alec okay. McKeithen. Mm -hmm. Well, the, uh, Going back to the, to the children, what was your dad's name? Warren Chestine Jernigan. Chestine. And there was a son that was a junior? Yes. The baby? Yeah, the one uh, that was born just before just me. Just before you. The last boy. Yeah. And uh, that was Warren. Okay, so then Merle Jernigan was William Merle. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. he was Willie, yeah. William Willie. Let me see. Merle. Let me get that wrong. Merle. Merle Willie. Yeah, okay. And Merle hated Willie. <laughs> he didn't like that name. Didn't like it at all, huh? Well, when he named his son, he became William Merle. Right. No, it became William Warren. <laughs> William Warren. See, Merle what? went with W. Oh, Warren. I was William Warren. Yeah. Yeah, that, that and, was Billy. Uh, that was Billy. Yeah, Billy. Well, uh, that's interesting to me, knowing them and growing up with them as neighbors. Yeah. But uh, you were talking earlier about uh, early memories, childhood memories of uh, different events. What, what is an early event that you might remember 
and you and yes a young person because I know that I remember back maybe till I'm five and I can't before five I don't remember much well you know some of these things are vague and I, I wonder sometimes if I really remember that or if it's a figure of imagination or somebody but um me. I think I'm four years older than she is, and I think I can remember standing at the foot of the bed and seeing that new baby. Oh, how exciting. <laughs> but how about I, you, Elizabeth, do you have any early memories? Well, I thought that um, I remembered my mother, see, I was just four, but we had company one day, and. I, they asked me, said, do you remember your mother at all? And I said, yes, I remember going to the hospital and getting in the bed with her. But my grandmother said, honey, you didn't go to the hospital. Said, your mom died on the table. Said, you, oh. you didn't go. So I know that hearing them talk about mama dying, I dreamed it. But it was so real to me that I thought I did it. And I would have thought it right on unless granny had corrected me. You know? Now we had, um, if you want us to tell some of the things we did, we can tell you loads of that. We can tell you some wild things. Wild story. And that was the time when Pop would say, Effie, take care of these girls. <laughs> was this uh, after you started school? Do you remember beginning school? Uh, in I the first do. Grade? Yeah, I remember. Mm -hmm. And I went in that building I'm telling you about. It was a big, big brick two-story building. That was the Welburn School. Yes. Uh -huh. And that building, um, I believe, um, it was built around 1924. Of course, I was born in 21, but I didn't start the school until I was six. But that was an awesome building to me. It was humongous. I bet it was. But, and this was you followed then four years later. Yeah. And I remember my teacher, my first grade teacher, was Naomi Mallory Dennard. And, you know, she lived to be 107 out at Dallin Park. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, she taught all of us, and my Aunt Effie was a teacher. She taught sixth grade, and she taught all of us. And my grandfather told us that if she has to get on to you at school, just know you're getting another one when you get home. So we all minded her. We yeah. were real good in her class. I bet. Well, uh, did you? When did you lose your grandparents or your parents and your grandparents? I, well, my grandmother died um, in 1952. Yeah, she died uh, in uh, nice one. November, wasn't it? Because mm -hmm. she died uh, just before my son was born, Lloyd. Okay. She never knew I had a little boy. Uh -oh. Well, that was, she, had, she was an old And uh, Papa died in 1938. They were both 74 when they died. Hmm. So, well, and getting, back, getting back to school, now I want to hear some of those wild stories. Billy, I didn't understand you. I said, I, getting back to school, I want to hear some of those wild stories. Yeah. Well, to get, let you in on one wild story, we walked to school, and I see... There was no fence laws. Cows roamed all over Welburn. And uh, me and Irene and Louise, we walked to school in the morning, and we walked home at lunch, back to school, and then back when school let out. Well, we would lead each other to school, and uh, two of us would lead one, you know. We'd blindfold them, and that was the way we went back. So the cows had uh, deposited so Irene and I led my sister through that, <laughs> and she, her shoe came off, and I don't remember what Granny done to us, but anyway, that was one of the wild stories. <laughs> well, in downtown Welburn, I, I understand it was a thriving community. It was. Were, I know several doctors in the community, and the we bank. Had, and, uh, we had a bank, and we had Dr. Barnett. He was lived in White Springs, but he came to Welburn every day. And we had, Mr. Cobb had a store, and uh, the Mosleys had a store, and the McLarens had a store. 
and E.B. McLaren had a cold storage, and Mr. McDonald had a garage there, and he also sold ice. And uh, Granny would send me to get a nickel's worth of ice, and it was a little block about that big. They tied a cord around it, and I would slip my fingers under it and to take it home. We lived about about two blocks or two and a half blocks from the cold storage, and uh, I'd have to set it down. But to get iced tea, I would go get it because we loved iced tea. And then he started a route. He would buy ice, and we got an ice box, and he would stop and put a big old block of ice in the ice box, and we had tea that way. Well, did uh, did do you have uh, electric power? No, we didn't no. have a refrigerator. So there was no no light. And Granny had a wood stove. And um, I remember when we were going to school that before I started the school that lots of times Granny cooked country food, you know, and she would take up the greens and she and I would eat before the rest of them come in from school. I remember that before I started the school. Well, long before you did get power, electricity. Was it uh, when you were in school? Yeah, uh -huh. we got electricity. Yeah, I was I was probably um, 10 or 12 years old when we got electricity. We didn't have screens to the doors uh, to, or to the windows, and we didn't have electricity, but my brother-in-law, my sister Carrie's husband, he wired the house. We had one long cord hanging down with a light bulb. But boy, that was something else. And in my home today, I have the lamps that we used, you know, kerosene, you know, that we would carry around as to see, you know, walking around at night. And I have those in my home, and I had them made electric, you know. But my house is full of old Welburn stuff. I have my mother and daddy's trunk, you know, that's the, what they used when they traveled. They used that trunk to pack their belongings in. We had one radio, and at night, Papa would turn it on, and we'd listen to Amos and Andy and Lum and Abner and... And uh, Fibber McGee and Molly. Fibber McGee and Molly. Then he would turn the radio off, and we went to bed. And that was battery operated. And my grandmother, you know, she had 11 children, and then she had me and my sister and brother. And uh, of course, when all them children came home with their families, we had a bunch of children there. And Granny, we had, our house was, uh, we had a little porch, and then we had a living room, and my aunt's bedroom, and another bedroom. Then there was uh, my grandmother's room, which was large and had two beds, double beds in it, and then another bedroom. But we had a hall that went all the way through the house. And my grandmother would put mattresses all down that hall and we'd get to sleep on them. And that was fun. That was a really treat, wasn't it? It was. Yeah. Well, at Christmas time, and all the family came, and, uh, but you went to a community Christmas yeah. celebration. Yeah, we always had our Christmas at church. And um, we had, um, I think, um, I can't remember whether the Baptist Sunday School was in the morning and the Methodist in the afternoon, but we went to both. And once a month, the Presbyterian preacher came from Jacksonville, and he'd visit around on Saturday afternoon. But Sunday was all Presbyterians. We went to the Presbyterian church because he had a little dish with candy in it. And before he started <laughs> preaching, he let every child come up there and get a piece of candy. So that Sunday, we were Presbyterians. Did, uh, but you mostly attended the Baptist church. Yes. yes. Right. Uh -huh. and, and grew up. Yeah, we both, we um, joined the Baptist church, I think, in 1936 in Wilburn. And um, I mentioned the McKeithans before, and Louise, uh, McKeith and Ellick's wife. Her sister's husband was E. Lim Daniels, and he was in Wilburn running what they call a revival, you know, so. Uh, and the, we attended the um, 100th anniversary of the Wilburn Baptist Church, and we were the oldest people 
there that had attended that church the longest. So, well, yeah, they said, uh, how many has been coming here since uh, 1934? 1932, 1930, 1920. <laughs> Irene and I stood up. Nobody had stood up in them years. We were the only two that had been there that long, you know. Well, I'm, it's certainly grown since then. Uh, but uh, the school now that you went to, and you said that you came to Live Oak after the 10th grade. Well, I attended Welburn through the 10th grade. And that, that was the highest grade that was taught there then. And I had to uh, ride the bus to Live Oak for my junior and senior year. And, and the year after I graduated, it was, Welburn was made a high school. Yeah, I, I graduated from Welburn and uh, I was valedictorian and <laughs> I traded all that there to Farmer and <laughs> worked in tobacco. <laughs> We both worked. Yes, I know. I know. Well, you went on to college. Yes. And that was after you married, though. Yes. And, uh, yeah, I was married 52 years yeah. when my husband died. And, and it ended up teaching for a long time. Yes. And retiring. I had two children. Uh, my daughter, Olivia, and she's in Jacksonville. Uh, she's a retired attorney. And my son, um, is in China teaching English. Uh, he worked in White Springs for uh, 32 years and retired and said, Mama, I want to do something different. So he's doing something different. That's wonderful. wonderful. But, and he really likes it. I bought me a, a Skype computer and I talk with him every night. That's great. That's wonderful. It's just like he was sitting across the table from me, you know. I've never used it, but I understand it's great. So, he always wants to know about Live Oak and everybody, you know. But, uh, you graduated from Live Oak in what year? 40. Well, that's a, a lot of changes in Live Oak, too. I should say so. All of those beautiful homes are gone, you know, uh, on Ohio Avenue, all except the Kirby House. And I don't know who that belonged to before he had it. But. But anyway, um, it's been a good life. Yeah. Elizabeth, you've been graduated, I guess, in 44? No, I graduated in uh, 42. 42. Mm -hmm. Okay, being so smart, you skipped a grade. <laughs> no, I never skipped a grade. Um, I had wonderful teachers, and the only way that I beat Virginia Pennington, she was salutatorian. And the only way I beat her was in history under Mr. Clayton Bass. And, uh, and Mr. Clayton Bass, we might add, was superintendent of the schools at one time. Yeah, and he was also principal at Welburn. And Ms. Bass taught literature and English. And um, I got married in my 12th year. And, uh, but I finished school and graduated, and I married a farmer. And I've been working ever since. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know part well, of your work was at the telephone company. Yes, I retired from there. Yeah. But we were taught to work. We had chores, you know, um, all the children had something to do. And if we had to fill up the wood box for the stove, you know, because the stove burned wood, you know, uh, we didn't ask Papa, well, do we have to? We knew what Papa said was it. That's time. like when you turned on the radio, we all sat around and listened, but when the program was over, he turned it off and we knew we went to bed. Well, now, you didn't have computers to, to hide under the sheets and talk to everybody then. I know. <laughs> well, the, after graduation, did you marry early? Yeah, I did. Uh, I married in 1942. Mm -hmm. I think it was 42. And I was 20 years old. Well, I married on January the 4th, and I was 20, and I was 21 the first day of February. And I had two children. I had Olivia, who was 72 now. And my son is, will be 59 in October, so there's 14 years difference in them. 
Well, after uh, high school and marriage and working on the farm and whatever, the first, I guess, event that we all remember would be World War II. Well, I was in Jacksonville working at the post office in World War II mm -hmm. part of the say, time. How did that affect your lives then? I know that... Uh, well, see, I married in 1941 in November. And uh, like I said, the Japs bombed Pearl Harbor December the 2nd. Well, um, seventh, I think. And uh, so they took husbands with one child. Well, that didn't, with uh, no three children, I think, at first. Then husbands with two, and that got my husband in the war. And uh, he, along with uh, one of Irene's brothers, Rufus, went to the Pacific. And um, he was in the Philippines, and then he was in Leyte Island. And they were just um, fixing to bomb Pearl Harbor, I mean, to uh, drop the atomic bomb. And he was fixing to go into Japan on foot. He wanted to be in the Navy, but his mother had was scheduled for surgery, and he didn't want to leave till she had that. So the draft got him. So he had to go in the Army. So uh, they were fixing to go into Japan on foot when uh, they dropped the atomic bomb, and that's all that saved him. That's well, can I tell something fun? Well, you know, the cows were on the streets, just like the children, you know. And uh, so, uh, Papa being a farmer, you know, we always had watermelons in the summer. Well, we had a, I had a nephew, my sister Carrie's son, and they would come visit us and Papa would always bring in a lot of watermelons and we'd cut them and we would tie, we'd fix a hole in the watermelon and tie a string in there and get out in front of the cows and pull that and the cows would try Jeez. to get the watermelon, you know. So one old cow, um, she didn't stop when she got to the watermelon, she just kept coming. And my nephew, uh, he was afraid, and he kept, uh, oh, since he saw the cow coming, he kept hollering, open the gate, open the gate, so he could get away from the cow. That was one of the fun things we did. Well, see, he didn't know that that cow would chase you whether you had any watermelon or not. <laughs> and um, one day I was going to school, and we had the God boats lived right across the street from us. Well, they had a son named Marvin, and we called him a smart aleck, you know. He would, uh, it was, you know, he'd do that at you. And so I was going back to school after lunch and I heard him keep doing that, you know, and I thought, I ain't gonna pay him any attention. So then I heard something and I turned around and here come that cow. Well, I run and jumped up on the, Papa owned a half a block and we had a big chicken yard with a huge grapevine in it and big pecan trees. Well, I jumped up on the fence, and of course, it rocked back and two with me. But anyway, the cow went on. And uh, <laughs> so we, I forgot what I was telling you now. But um, well, anyway, the cow, you know, was chasing. Uh, yeah, so uh, Jimmy didn't know that the cow chased you anyhow, and we didn't think to tell him. So he put his watermelon rind down in front of her, and she went to chasing him. Well, when she got close, he dropped the string. She kept a coming, and we heard him open the gate, open the gate, open the gate. So we opened the gate, and he came in. But he remembered that cow. He didn't put his one metal right in front of her no more. And then another fun thing was on Saturday afternoon. You want to tell about uh, uh, the black man? Well, Granny had. Uh, she had, you know, she raised fourteen children. Well, she had two washwomen, Rosa and Evelina. They were black. And then she had Cooka that helped her in the kitchen, done the ironing and helped her, you know, like that. So Rosa was married to Ed, and he was a little old black man, you know, and every Saturday he'd get drunk. Well, we lived right on 90. When you went out our back gate, there was 90. So uh, he would walk down 90 drunk and he'd go down in the ditch and up, and every Saturday evening we got lined up on the fence to watch him go by. That was one of our fun things. But you had to make your fun back then, you know. Yes. Well, what about uh, 
childhood games uh, besides making cows run after you or or making your sister stand and <laughs> step in? Well, on rainy afternoons, we got under the edge of the house and we played stick frog. You know what that is? Uh, okay, we had a little knife and you put it between your fingers and you do it like, the point is to get it over you and stick up in the dirt. So why do we didn't get cut, but we never did. But we played that on, and then, um, Red we, Rover, Red Rover. We played Red Rover, Red Rover, let Irene come over, you know, and then, um, May we, I? And then we uh, would fill up syrup cans full of dirt and run a wire through it, you know, and we'd make roads and then uh, we'd, uh, when all the other grandchildren were there, we'd play family. We'd get in that chicken yard, cause it was huge. And uh, we'd build houses, you know, and then uh, for money, we lose pecan leaves for dollars and we use broke glass for change. And we'd have a store and we'd get under the grapevine and we'd pick them green grapes and we'd stick a toothpick or something in them like that and sell them for suckers. We had them <laughs> in the store. But every time, see, the, they told us, they'd stay out from under that grapevine. Don't you let me catch you eating them green grapes. So every time we'd hear the screen door slam out from under the grapevine, we'd go. <laughs> but uh, Carolyn, which was, uh, my cousin, and I was from October to January older than her, and uh, didn't realize she was eating so many grapes, green grapes, but she got the stomachache. And they said, have y'all been under that grapevine? No, no, we ain't been under there. <laughs> so her mama gave her a dose of castor oil. <laughs> and that told, that told on us that it was nothing but grape holes. <laughs> so we got told off good for that. But we had no toys. We didn't get toys at Christmas like kids do today. And we had to make our fun. And we went out in the chicken yard. Everything we played mostly was in the chicken yard. And we dig holes and bury our feet and legs up to our knees. And then we just, you know, just wobble around. <laughs> we had to just make our fun. We didn't yeah. have any toys. We didn't get toys for Christmas. You didn't have a doll or? I don't remember, but three dolls. Now, one of her brothers, he left home and went to Jacksonville and he worked in the National Lunch. And uh, we had a man that lived in Wilburn, the Carrots. Douglas. Douglas. And uh, he would go to Jacksonville once a week and get meat. He hauled meat. So uh, my uncle sent me a doll by him one time. And my grandmother, she, she play, I want to say this too. Uh, my grandmother and grandfather raised four ch 14 children and I never, ever heard a crossword between them. It was kindness and love for all those children. Never heard anything, you know, and never heard him say, an ugly word, a curse word, and my one of their sons, Lamont, he, they wanted to go hunting, and uh, my grandfather wouldn't let them take the shotgun. his shotgun. You know, it was at around Thanksgiving, so uh, they went across the street and borrowed the neighbor's gun, and they went hunting and they killed the ducks, but um, one of my uncles started out to get the ducks and he couldn't swim well enough, he turned around and come back. So Lamont was a very good swimmer, so he went after him, but he took the cramp and he drowned. Oh. On Granny's At birthday. At 19. On Granny's birthday. So I was just six, but I remember somebody knocked on the door, my grandfather went to the door, and I heard my grandfather say, oh my God, and I knew something bad had happened because he never took the name of the Lord in vain, yeah. never. So it was that they had come to tell him about Lamont. That's a shame. I miss Our home was a gathering place for the children at Wilburn. We had enough that we could have a, a ball team or whatever, but we used to play tin cans. Have you ever played tin cans? <laughs> well, anyway, you got a bunch of cans and you stacked them up and you had a bat and you'd knock them down and everybody go hide. And of course, uh, 
if you didn't find everybody and somebody came in, uh, they just stacked up the cans again and, they, you know, you had to start hunting everybody again. And that was one of the games that we played. And you see, it didn't cost anything. So, um, well, you, now, what, what did them wheels come off? We had big old round wheels like that. And we'd get a little piece of wire and bend it, and we'd roll that wheel all over Wilbur. <laughs> and on the front porch, there was three rockers, and Irene and Louise and me. And we'd get in there and we'd sing every song in the songbook, and they could hear us uptown. <laughs> but we didn't care. Well, now, I know the main street in Welburn is the brick. Yeah. And that's the original street. Was there another paved street or brick street? Or no, that was the only we one? called that, that the only one. We called that the brick road, and it went all the way through Welburn. And we would skate. My cousin, when they came, they would. My cousin Carolyn, she would bring her old skates to me, and we would skate up and down that brick road. Time I got some scars on my knees now where I'd fall and hit a rock, and it'd stick in your leg, you know, or yeah, knee. That. That was tough ski, uh, skating on that brick, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, well, across from that brick store in Welburn, there was a filling station. And I was skating under there, and I fell down and knocked the breath out of me, and I thought I would never catch my breath. I think in this Welburn book, there's a picture of Maurice Geiger with skates on, mm -hmm. on, that, pay, on that brick street. And I thought, when I saw that, I thought, that was a rough, place to skate. It was, but we skated. But she didn't have problems with, with automobiles because there wasn't very many automobiles. Right. So there wasn't much danger in getting hit by a car. No, we <laughs> not, hardly ever saw a car. Well, 90. And Granny, she took me and Irene Louise on the Greyhound bus to Live Oak to buy our clothes. And um, so when I was 12 years old, she went to Chattanooga to visit one of her daughters and carried me. And um, we stayed there, and then we went on to Birmingham to visit another one of her sons. And when we went to get on the bus to come home, the driver said, I know you. And I said, no. I felt like I was so far away from home in Birmingham. I said, no, you don't. I'm a long ways from home. He said, I'll put you off at your back gate. So I just waited to see, and he did. And come to find out, he was the driver that drove the Greyhound bus when Granny would take us to live boat to buy clothes. But um, he would blow the horn every night when he come through there, you know, after that. But, at, but when we went anywhere, if there was no other passengers to get off, he let us off at our back gate. That was uh, back when people really were nice. Mm -hmm. I remember my grandparents lived in Tallahassee, and as a small child, mother would just put me on the bus in Live Oak, and the bus driver would put me off the bus in Tallahassee. Yeah. You know, and I was preteen. I certainly, you know, young, but they don't do that anymore. No. But you know, those were good times, Billy. You know, um, people cared, and today, you know, you don't find people that too much to care. We're talking about Irene's brother, Debbie C. He would get up in the morning and he'd go all over the neighborhood and see what they was going to have for dinner, for lunch. <laughs> and whoever had what he liked the best, that's where he ate lunch. <laughs> that but was Debbie all, C. Jr. Yeah. But see, everybody knew everybody. Yeah. And um, that was the good news and the bad news. Mm -hmm. They tell on you if you're doing wrong, too. Yeah, they you would. You want to tell about the bathrooms? <laughs> about what? The bathrooms. <laughs> the uh, <mat> the <laughs> <laughs> I might better not tell that. <laughs> oh, it's okay. Well, anyway, you, you know, house. back then we didn't have electricity. We didn't have screen doors and windows. And we didn't have indoor plumbing. So we had an outhouse for the girls and one for the boys. Well, back then, you know, you didn't, you, they didn't make toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> but the women had Sears, Sears catalogs. You wouldn't believe the men had corn cobs. <laughs> so we, we grew up with 
Well, you know, there's been a lot of changes. And it's a life of luxury now. And we didn't get too much candy and stuff, but there was a man that lived on the corner away from us, and sometimes he'd catch me walking back to school, and he'd go in Miss Pearl's store and buy me a nickel's worth of candy. Well, you got five Hershey Kisses for a penny. For a penny. So I'd have a bag full of candy. But we didn't get a lot of candy. But if we got a bar of candy, we'd take the paper off and lick it. And then <laughs> if some of the neighbor's children come and wanted some of it, we'd tell them, well, I licked it. I don't care. <laughs> we had to give them some anyway. Yeah, a bar of candy was scarce. Christmas time was but your big, you big time for candy, I guess. You but got you, your candy bar or, or, a, or a peppermint cane or something. But Papa provided well for us. He would buy bananas by the bunch and raisins by the box. And of course, oranges and all kind of fruit, you know, by, by the box. And, and he bought flour by the barrel. And, and the sugar, sugar by the hundred pounds. And it was in a pantry. So uh, when we'd come in from school, Granny would have a bunch, we called them tea cakes. Well, she'd put them on top of the flour barrel, so the sifter would be there, and then she'd put that pan of tea cakes. Well, her mother, which was my great-grandmother, she'd come to visit, and we'd come in from school and head for the kitchen to the tea cakes, you know. And she'd come in right behind us, and she was just four feet something. And she'd say, don't you get into your moth supper. Don't you get into your moth supper. Stay out of there. But I remember hanging over that barrel. See, they bought flour. And I remember hanging over that barrel to get them cookies. Wasn't tall enough to reach down in there, but you just hung over it, you know. But we had a, a good growing we up We never time. knew that we didn't get toys and things like that because we had to use our imagination and just make things to do, you know. Well, after uh, high school and marriage and college and working and everything, you have been very lovely ladies and we appreciate <laughs> so much your doing this interview and telling us about the life in Welburn early on. Well, yeah. we, had a, we had a good life, didn't I'm we? I'm glad. Papa provided boil for us yeah. and of course he died. I was only 17 when Papa died, but uh, if he was at home and if he kind of took over, you know. And I was 13, but when later when he got sick, he would give me a nickel to wash his feet. And I didn't mind washing his feet, but he'd make me wash between his toes. <laughs> and I hated to do that, but I'd do it for a nickel. <laughs> uh, the rich life. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's good, don't you? Thank you, I think, I think we've Covered about, covered about everything. But our I old house. Questions I'd like to ask, but I guess we've used up enough time. But there's a lot to tell, but a lot of it you don't dare tell. <laughs> <laughs> Just be strictly for women, probably. What was uh, your mother's maiden name? Haskew. H A S K E W. They were from South Carolina too? Uh, Papa was from Aiken, South Carolina, but on my birth certificate it said that Mama was born in Lake City. Mm -hmm. But now her mother, who was a Wilson, was born in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. So I have a lot of this, Olivia and I have a lot of it on, uh, well she has a computer and a lot of it on that. Family tree maker. Yeah, so, I'm, I'm writing a book good. about our growing up. My children want to know so much, you know, and they ask so many questions. I said, well, I'm just going to write a book and tell all these things, you know, that we did. Well, I'd like to see it when you finish. Okay. And, and you know, Billy, of course, like I said, Effie was 21 years older than me. She was born in 1900. Um, she loved us like we were her children. If she went to Jacksonville and bought her a dress, she bought three more. She took care of us. Yeah, we loved her. Well, 
We Actually, had, she was like another mother. We had a, a real happy growing up time. And we never knew that we didn't have a lot because everybody was the same boat. <laughs> And we didn't know we didn't know we were not sisters till we got to be big children. Is that right? Yeah. See, yeah. I was born there, and she was just well. At one time, she's three years older than me, and another time, she's four. And she remembers. <laughs> well, I see now she's uh, in a month and a half. I'll be ninety-one. She'll be three years older than me. But February the first, then she'll be four years older. Than I'll me. be ninety-five. Yeah. Uh, 95, I live by myself, uh, I still drive, take care of my business, and aggravate her. Well, I still drive, and I take care of my business, and aggravate her. <laughs> but we're real close, you know, and we have many times people that want to know if we're twins. Um, if she cooks, I eat with her. If I cook, she eats with me. And if we don't want to cook, we go out. And we go out a lot. <laughs> but it's a good life. We drive to Lake City. A lot of times. Well, I guess they're through with us. I guess so.